Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he means to each of us. Father, we invite you here to help us and guide us, and we just ask your blessings and comfort for all of those in the world. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Gail, would you do roll call? Mike Shambaugh? Here. Joe Deere? Here. Keith Austin? Here. Danny Callison? Here. Julia Coates? She's here. Sean Crittenden? Here. Mike Dobbin? Here. Rex Jordan? Here. Johnny Kidwell? Here. Daryl Legg? Here. Wes Snowfire? Here. Dora Paskowski? Here. Joshua Sam? My Bonda Shop Pouch, E.O. Smith, yes. Candessa Teehee, Victoria Vasquez. Have a corn. All right. If you've had a chance to look at the minutes, could I have a motion? Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. First of all, we'll have Scott Craig with the uh, Marshals Service. Uh, Shannon couldn't be here today. Uh, Scott, are you on the. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I'm Scott Craig. I'm one of Shannon's captains. Um, I believe the uh, monthly report had been submitted to you all, and uh, Shannon asked me to see if there was any questions or anything that I could answer for anyone. So anybody got any questions for Scott? All right, Scott, looks like you uh, had an easy day today. I escaped that time. Thank you, you did. sir. All right, you have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Be, be careful. All right. From the Office of the Attorney General, Sarah Hill. Hill, Sarah, are you here? I am here. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Um, I am sorry that I can't be there in person, but I'm still glad to address the Tribal Council today. I wanted to uh, first give you an update on our tribal court cases and processes, which has sort of become my normal uh, report. So during my last report, we had filed 2,836 new criminal cases. Um, today, that number is 3,300. We've also received 503 referrals for juvenile services, up from 390 referrals reported in November. Um, unfortunately, the holidays are usually a bit busy time for uh, law enforcement and a busy time um, also in the juvenile division. So they've been, been extremely busy through the holidays, and I've been very proud of the work that they've continued to do. The, uh, there's been an important update in the Supreme Court, which is the, the bulk of my report today. As I discussed with all of you previously, Oklahoma filed numerous petitions with the U.S. Supreme Court presenting one or two questions for review, depending on the, the petition. The first question that they presented was, does the state have jurisdiction in Indian country concurrent with the U.S. with respect to crimes allegedly committed by non-Indians against Indians, which they filed that question, I think, in about seven of the cases. And then the second question, which they presented in all cases, was should McGirt be overturned? And there were roughly, I think, more than 45 petitions at last count that the state had asked the Supreme Court to overturn McGirt. Of these petitions, there were 38 of them that were considered at the January 21st conference before the Supreme Court. They had been considered several times before that, but they were there were 38 pending that day. Um, from that, there was one grant of cert in the Castro Huerta case. They denied cert in 32 of them, and in five of them, they took no action. Um, and what the court did, though, in the case that it granted cert in, um, which was Castro Huerta, the court granted the petition but limited it to question one. So the only question that the court is going to consider is um, whether or not a state has authority to prosecute non-Indians who commit crimes against Indians in Indian country. So that's the singular question that the Supreme Court is interested in in Castro Huerta. They refuse to consider whether or not McGirt should be overturned, and it denied cert in all of the other petitions where that was the only question that was before the court. So that the up, the takeaway from that is that the court is not interested in reviewing McGirt. They're not interested in overturning their decision in McGirt. Um, and that's, a, of course, a huge, huge deal for the tribes because the state had been on a pretty consistent um, you know, talking tour. I think you've seen multiple state uh, individuals saying that McGirt is all of these terrible things that needs to be overturned. And it was um, our, our amicus brief to the court um, pushed back on that and said, you know, the, it doesn't need to be overturned. Um, and also the situation as it's painted for the court by the state is not accurate and putting forward what, what we thought were the real facts in Indian country and the law enforcement. 
And so it was very gratifying to see the court um, decide not to hear the issue of whether or not McGirt should be overturned. The remaining question um, that, that the court is going to be faced with, I think it's important. I mean, it's definitely an important question in Indian country because it would be the same answer in Indian country anywhere. I think it's important to know this isn't a McGirt issue. I mean, it, it arose in a case on our reservation and our reservation was impacted by McGirt. But this issue, whether or not the state has concurrent jurisdiction over non-Indians in Indian country, has nothing to do with McGirt and has nothing to do with the reservation status of the Cherokee Nation. Those issues are at rest today. Um, so the only it's a, just a specific question about criminal jurisdiction in Indian country broadly. So I hear people say sometimes that the court might limit McGirt or the court might do something to McGirt. And I don't think that that's really the case. Um, in reality, the court isn't, isn't going to consider disturbing its decision in McGirt by in, in any way. It's only considering this issue of jurisdiction. Um, so th I think that's an important thing to take away about it. The other thing that goes along with that is to keep in mind that the decision that the court makes in that, whether they decide the state does or doesn't have concurrent jurisdiction over non-Indians, it doesn't affect tribal jurisdiction at all. So the AG's office and the courts will continue to have jurisdiction over Indians who commit crimes on the reservation, will continue to have jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit domestic violence on the reservation, and it won't in any way limit the tribe's jurisdiction. No matter what the court does, it's, I can't see how any, any decision they would make would affect the tribe's jurisdiction. So I just wanted to sort of walk you through some of those elements of this, because I don't know that it's immediately apparent if you don't follow all the ins and outs of this, what's going on here. The last thing I would say about this is that this doesn't mean that we can relax our guard at all. Um, we know that the state hasn't changed their viewpoint on McGirt, and there are lots of other issues that they could try to bring to the Supreme Court or to other courts. And so we have to continue to be extremely vigilant um, about keeping an eye on the different types of litigation that are going on and the different claims that the, the state may make in the future. So with that, that's the that's the big ticket item from the last uh, couple of weeks and the thing that I thought was the most important to sort of walk through with you in terms of what that decision is and what it might mean for the Cherokee Nation. We will certainly file uh, an amicus in this case and we will continue to be, this case did arise on the Cherokee Reservation. And so um, we're definitely gonna be participating and in informing the court about our viewpoints. Um, but I wanted you to know the, the limited scope of the case and its limited sort of impact that it would have on the work that we do every day in Indian country. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you all might have. Hey, sir, just a quick, try to see if I understand this correctly. So in that first section, they're gonna go and see if the state can do non-native criminal acts when it's happened against a native and didn't that happen a long time ago in, in the federal acts when they talked about the trade and the assembly action act the only time the state could do that if there wasn't a criminal code by the feds the only way that they could reach through there through prosecution it, it's um if this has been the rule it's been the rule in indian country that the state lacks jurisdiction over these types of crimes for a, a, more than 150 years this has always been the rule in indian country that and there's a lot of different, you know, even going back in time to the Wooster case. I mean, that case was about whether or not the state could exert jurisdiction over a non-Indian in Indian country. That's what Wooster was about. So these issues have been taken up and been decided from by the court from the earliest days of the Republic. And the answer has been pretty consistent from the court throughout its history. You know, the state has no way to obtain jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit crime in Indian country unless Congress steps in using its plenary power and says, okay, we're going to give this to the state. And I don't know that the state can point to any place where Congress has done that. It's the, the court has certainly never found before that that was the case. Um, now, there are some other, you know, I don't want to get too far in the weeds on all of this, but there are a lot of other statutes, too, where at different times Congress has stepped in and said, okay, in this case, we do want the state to have jurisdiction over, over either Indians or non-Indians in this circumstance. So Congress has a mechanism to do that if it wants to do that. And I think the court is going to be considering from Oklahoma, you know, is there, is there some language in the statute that maybe was interpreted one, by, one way by the court previously, and today we want to look at it a different way. That's what the, the state is asking the court to do. Yeah, because I know there's certain ones in the, what, is it 1151 ABC or whatever that was, that, you know, the land and trust allotments, it was all these exemptions. But since the beginning of it, like you said, what, way back in the early 1800s, the feds were supposed to protect the tribes, correct? And the only way they couldn't do that is if the, the statutes are real different. Is I just want to yeah, do a I mean, clarification. Am I on the right deal why they would review that? 
Yes, that is the right question. You are describing the issue the way that the way that is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate all the work you guys do. Thanks, Chair. You're up. Is that me that you called on? <laughs> yes, ma'am. You're up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just, my question was basically the same as Councillor Deers, I think. I was thinking in the same direction, but I, I wanted to uh, follow up a little bit. Um, it led to one other. So I, yeah, this is what you're describing has always been under federal jurisdiction. And so now uh, the, the court is considering expanding that um, criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians committing crimes against Indians on reservations to the state as well. Um, is, and Congress has not legislated this, except in very specific instances. Is that what I'm understanding? That's correct. I think, you know, obviously the state would give you a different answer. They would say, well, we've read the statutes and we think that this is what Congress intended. But from my point of view, and, and based on the other cases that, that speak to this issue and the other laws that Congress has passed, I don't think that's the case. Okay, so um, so there would be, that was my question. If the, if the court allowed this, then effectively, I was thinking the court would be legislating something new. But you're saying that... Um, that there is an argument, there are some uh, things that they could look at as um, a basis for for taking this action, perhaps. Well, you know, it takes four of them to accept cert. So I, I, I presume that at least four of them see enough, you know, we argued in our amicus brief on this issue and we argued that there was no no reason to grant cert on this. This was a well, you know, well decided issue of law. There's no split in the circuits, which is sometimes will trigger the court to review it. None of those things are really are really here, but obviously at least four members of the court feel like there's enough here to have a look at it anyway. So um, and I'm, it's beyond me to attempt to guess the minds or thoughts of the members of the Supreme Court. So we will, we will get there and we will brief it and we will answer their questions as best we can. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying for me. Thank you so much. I really hope that everyone, you know, took a little moment when they heard the news, wherever they were when they heard the news, to celebrate the fact that at least for this term, um, the attempts to overturn McGirt are dead. I think that is something that we should, we should all make everyone smile and make a step a little, a little bit higher. Um, it's a big, big deal. We still have an issue left that we're, we're going to have to argue in front of the court, but it is huge to escape um, having to uh, deal with having a real challenge to McGirt just one year after it's been decided. Um, we're all really pleased about that. Okay, Sean. Hi, uh, ma'am. How are you? Doing great, Councilman. Um, I've, I've reached out, and you've been great about every individual question I've had about some of the questions our local law enforcement officers have had, and I think we've even talked about maybe a little meeting between those. But I know you can't have a every time something arises, you know, you can't have a meeting every time, you know. So what's the best way just if if a law enforcement a local law enforcement uh, has some questions about different situations that come up, um, what what would be your preference? You know, just calling you every time, uh, emails. Um, what's your preference on how we get those addressed without calling a meeting in Adair County every time or a meeting in Delaware County every time? Well, you know, we're always happy to meet if that's what's needed. But a lot of times if the questions are relatively, you know, and sometimes the, the questions come up, they need to be answered right then. It can't always wait. Um, one of the things that we have in our law enforcement protocol, which all of the law enforcement officers should have, is there's a 1-800 number that our office answers 24 hours a day. So if something happens and the law enforcement officer is in the middle of the night and they have a question about a search warrant or whatever else the, question, the issue may be, they can call uh, our hotline and talk to one of the lawyers um, that we have here. And they're, the people who answer it are criminal attorneys and the most knowledgeable folk. That's usually a good place to start. If they don't know the answer, they can usually find it. Um, they can also, of course, always reach out to me via phone, or they can reach out to Sandy Crossland, who is, you know, sort of the, the criminal chief that we have over here, who, who wrangles our entire criminal section. Um, and either one of us would be happy to answer those questions as well if we can. All right. And let me say again, you've been great about answering those calls from me for sure. Um, that one eight hundred number, they could also, they could also pass along some concerns as well that may be happening. 
you know, more than once at their at their local place. Is that that right? They could uh, get some sure. concerns passed on. All right. Well, that that sounds yeah, like that, a. That will take them directly. Sorry. Well, no, that sounds like a great deal. The the hotline. So uh, appreciate what you do. See you soon. Wes. Yeah, Miss Hill. Um, two questions, and we'll start with the first one. Um, the uh, I've seen where the governor uh, is opening up a 30-day window for negotiations over the hunting and fishing compact, but he claimed that we didn't make our payments or didn't purchase enough licenses per our compact. Um, and I thought, well, surely we appropriated the funds, and we did, and I wanted to look at the at the budgeting, and I seen where we made the payments to the Oklahoma Fishing and uh, Wildlife uh, for those licenses. So I don't know where he's coming up with this idea that somehow we weren't good on our payment for the licenses. D do you know much about what's going on there or what the uh, works on negotiations for a new compact or, or kind of where are we at with that? Because I just had heard about it. Uh, the, the governor does say that. Um, I don't, I think the governor is confused about um, a lot of things that happened between this tribe and OVWC, the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. I think he just doesn't understand maybe exactly how it has worked. Um, I don't think that there's any, I'm, I'm certain that there's no, uh, no good legal claim in all of the things that he says. Um, there's no, as far as I know, there's no, he's not interested in any sort of compact or agreement with the tribe. So there's no kind of negotiations going on about that. Um, I don't, I, I am not going to, we're being threatened with litigation by the governor, which is, you know, a fairly common state of affairs um, at the moment. So I would, I'm not going to get into all of the details of that, of his claims, but I will tell you that I have, I've looked at all of the facts that he alleges and I, I have no concerns about the, about the Cherokee Nation's behavior and all of this. And I'd be happy, Councilman, to go over the details with you uh, privately, but would prefer not to do that um, at the Rules Committee meeting today. Okay. Appreciate that. And then the other one is how many major crimes act have we filed in our courts and how many have been handled in our courts? So the major crimes act um, was really about federal jurisdiction over Indian country. Do you mean how many major crimes would be major crimes if they, if the United States did try them? Yeah. Have we had, we already filed those in our courts and handled those the murder cases and, and such like that in our own court. We do have a, a murder yeah, we do have a murder case. We do have some serious cases in our in our court. When we do have one murder case in our court, no, we I maybe mean, we've got two. Um, so we do have some serious what you know what what would be major crimes crimes that the United States would also have jurisdiction over for the most part. If they're major crimes, the feds pick those up and prosecute those. But we do have some in our court. I couldn't tell you the exact number we're going through and looking at. All, because there's a large list of crimes that are considered major crimes. Right. And I have to compare that to everything that's been filed in the tribal court to give you a number on that, which I can't do. But I can tell you that we do have, you know, pretty much any sort of case you would find um, in the in the state, you, it's possible that you will find it here up to and including a murder case. I had several of them filed. Okay. That's all the questions I have today. Thank you, Chair. Any other questions? Doc? I'll just... Uh, General Hill, what was that 800 number that you suggested for law enforcement to get immediate input on? It's a, it's, I don't know that it's a 800 number. It is a continuously answered number. Um, I, I can get it to you. I don't have our law enforcement protocol. We send it out to all the law enforcement agencies so that they would have that number, the, all the local officers would, and I can send that out to the whole tribal council. I'll just send you our, our the numbers. There's a, also one for the marshal service and one for the courts, and I can just send the council all those numbers. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? And I think Councilman Nofar, I, um, I remember Chad said something about we were uh, going to buy X amount of, of licenses, um, but the state was wanting us to, said that we had, the person who had them had to have like a, a driver's license. And we were going to uh, we said, well, we can't come up with that because some of our citizens don't have driver's license. We'll buy them anyway. And I believe they refused to sell us those, even though we opted to buy them because they had their rules too. I don't know how many uh, that did encompass. Uh, Chad would probably know better than me. But I think that's part of the reason why we didn't buy all of them. We offered to, but they wouldn't accept 
because some of our citizens didn't have driver's licenses. So, I, I, but I don't know what percentage that was. I, I don't, I mean. I say I, I've yeah. got the compact here, and I could see where it could be confusing. I, yeah. I kind of saw that too, where it says 150 compact license for its Oklahoma resident citizens. Yeah. So you have to prove that they're a citizen here. Right. State driver's license would do that, but if we don't have it, it's kind of one of those things where the compact yeah. itself kind of falls on it uh, on being very difficult to manage. Um, something I wish we would have been able to catch if I would have been on the council back in 2015. But appreciate it. Yeah, that, that's definitely a problem. Thank you. Anybody else? Ma'am, we appreciate you. We appreciate you fighting, uh, continue the fight with, for the nation. Um, we just appreciate what kind of job you're doing. Good job. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, four requests, GRA, Gwen Terpin. Gwen, are you on? Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, for the calendar year of 2021, we had a total of 15 FOIA requests and one GRA request because I do one by the calendar year instead of by the physical year. Um, everything's been updated, and you all should have a copy of my report. Does anybody have any questions for Gwen? All right. Thank you, ma'am. Good report. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. All right. With the Election Commission, we have Marcus Fears. Marcus, are you on? I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. What have you got for us today? All right. Uh, so you have my report there. Uh, the only thing that I wanted to mention that was not on there was due to COVID, the EC was unable to meet uh, in January. Um, so we're crossing our fingers and praying that everything's going to be back on track for February. Um, but uh, other than that, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Anybody have any questions for Marcus? All right, Marcus, doesn't look like there's any questions. You have a good evening, sir. You too. Thank you. All right, from the Tax Commission, Sharon Swepson. Sharon, are you on? Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I believe you do have my report, and I would try to answer any questions you might have. Does anybody have any questions for Sharon? Keith? Could you bring us up to date on the uh, the move in Katusa? Uh, is it all functioning well? And uh, uh, yes, anything we need to know um, regarding that for our for our constituents. Um, as far as Katusa goes, we are up and running. Uh, we opened up last Wednesday, and uh, we had a little slowdown that morning with we had a credit card issue, but by noon that was fixed, and since then everything has been up and running. So we are. At the new location, there are uh, the addresses posted on the website. I believe it's also been out on Facebook. And then there's also signs on the building letting them know where we're at. Thank you. Really appreciate your team working so hard to uh, serve the citizens in this uh, uh, unnecessary uh, situation that occurred to us. So thank you. Well, I you're welcome. And I will tell you that everyone worked really hard, my group, but there were so many other people that helped us be able to make that move so quickly. I know David Moore's group, facilities, Stony Benarski, I mean, IT, there, we just had lots of help and everybody just jumped right in and we got it done and it, it went very well. Thank, thank your team again. Anybody else? Okay, what about uh, Jay as the additional help started in Jay yet? Yes, we do have an additional worker there. Then she got COVID and was out, <laughs> but I do believe that she she is back. So we are struggling, but wow. but hopefully we'll have that good to go for a while. So, And I too would like to um, just say great job. I mean, gosh, thing with the Katusa office just popped up and it was unforeseen, but uh, you guys did a good job of uh, keeping things going, and uh, gosh, just like always, Sharon. Every time I call you, you answer your phone, and and you're always there. Uh, you're always there to do your job well. So, just want to say thank you. Thank you. All right. You have a good evening. You too. All right. 
uh, self-governance. Ashley Fox is out today, so Tara Lee will be taking questions. Tara Lee, are you there? I'm here, sir. All right. Uh, do we have a? Do you have anything to put or say? Nothing to add, sir. You have the report, and I'll be happy to take any questions. All right. Does anybody have any uh, questions for Tara Lee? All right, ma'am. Uh, no questions. You have a good evening. You too. All right. The Gaming Commission, Janice Purcell. Janice, are you there? Yeah, I am. How are you? We're good. Thank you. I submitted re my report, and if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to assist. Does anybody have any questions for Janice? Uh, Wes? Hey, Janice. Um, I have been a pleasure being at the past couple of meetings, the Gaming Commission meetings. I know one of the things that was brought up was um, on our employee background checks, uh, dealing with uh, our standard FBI background checks. It also used to include a credit check uh, to get a, a license. But I think um, you said that it's not the uh, part of the minimum requirement to have a background check. Are we still going to move forward with doing background checks Would that include the credit check, or are we going to remove the credit check aspect on those employees? On the background checks, what is required from NIGC is um, a background check as to any criminal behavior or protective orders. Um, a credit check is not even required by the state. And what was happening is people that were applying for jobs, say, as a cocktail waitress, they were not getting a job because they were over $20,000 in debt, and that was the threshold. Um, and if anyone has had any uh, lapse in employment, um, it can affect your credit. And if a credit check's not required, um, if, for instance, there were uh, any, any reason to question someone um, integrity, it would, it would fall upon the background check for criminal um, issues. So, no, the threat report is no longer required. Okay. Um, are we going to, I mean, my concern with that is you have a lot of money. There's a lot of money flowing around. There's changing change machines going on left and right, not, not accusing anyone of anything, but you definitely want to prevent any sort of theft that's going on with that kind of money being, being handled. I know things like cocktail waitresses aren't going to be handling a whole lot of money, but they deal with tips and whatnot and cash registers. Um, is there at least a – are you going to include a certain level like, okay, uh, people that are behind uh, the vault are going to have to have – the credit check to see how they've handled money before in their past. It may should not show up in a red flag criminally because they never got tried criminally for it, but it might show up in their in their credit report. Are we going to require that, or is it just across the board, no credit checks? NRGC has instituted several changes to gaming license, and one of the major questions is, is do they work for operations? If they work for corporate, we have no... Uh, authority to even do a background check at all. Um, so mainly the employees that receive a gaming license are primary management or key employees. Um, and there have not been any issues with the integrity of any of the casinos as far as theft. Um, and I think that will continue to be true. So I have faith that the background checks that we are currently doing um, have produced really good employees. But one problem we do have is getting additional employees. We do have some shortages at the casinos. So um, if you would like to discuss this further, I really enjoy you coming to our uh, meetings and um, we could follow that through at, at that time. Yeah, we'll follow through more with it. It's just a concern of mine. That's that's uh, uh, dealing with the, uh, that. It may have been one of the stop checks that would have been able to prevent us from having that problem with, with theft, and hopefully it rings true moving forward without having it in place. And appreciate the answer to those questions and look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. 
Speaker. Anybody else? Sean? Yeah, I'm just going to. If you haven't worked at one of the casinos, um, I've I worked several years at at a casino and got the ins and outs. And uh, I've never been in the surveillance room, though. I mean, not just anybody can go in there. But cameras. You know, sometimes my drawer itself was a hundred thousand. You know, you know, just it. It's crazy the money, but. It's crazy, the cameras. You raise that pinky up wrong way. Used to deal some blackjack. You raise that pinky up the wrong way, they're tapping you on the shoulder. So, and the vault especially. Sometimes if you're working the casino and somebody calls in on the count team, you have to go be the count team. But, uh, you know, all the movies you watch about robbing banks and stuff, there's just no way. I mean, that eye in the sky, Used to at Siloam, there was a convenience store when the casino actually set back away a crop. Well, there's still a convenience store. One of my surveillance buddies says they can read a pop can. Here it'd be about the same distance as probably our convenience store, but they said you could read a pop can from that camera. It was so strong. Huh. And uh, so any concerns about the security and that was years ago before I was working there when the transition from bingo, sure enough, bingo, then it went to electronic bingo. Then they started getting some, their little slot machine looking things. But, but it's, uh, you know, it goes, I guess it goes through lots of people's mind when they see stacks of $100 bills there. But they just, my experience, there's just no way, no way to, to do that. So I, I feel confident in what you guys are doing up there and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Anybody else? Candessa? Yeah, I understand the issue of uh, credit checks and debt may be a concern to some, but if you're looking at a $20,000 um, threshold on whether someone is a risk or not, I would wager that there are a huge number of Americans who have far beyond $20,000 in debt just from student loans. So, um, I, I mean, I think when you're looking at the type of debt that's being carried, that would probably be of greater concern than just kind of setting an arbitrary, you know, this is, this is what you can't exceed. So while I appreciate the issue being brought forward, I think there are uh, more subtleties um, for consideration on, on that particular issue. And I also echo uh, what Councillor Crittenden just shared about the high level of security within uh, Cherokee Nation casinos, and not just Cherokee Nation casinos either. I know that Oklahoma's Indian gaming um, is one of the most highly regulated forms of gaming in uh, the nation and perhaps in the world. And I know that Cherokee Nation maintains a very high standard um, with, uh, with oversight from the uh, Cherokee Nation Gaming Commission and then the um, high level of integrity of uh, the uh, corporate uh, part that oversees our gaming. So um, I just wanted to add that and thank you for the time, Chair. Okay. Anybody else? All right, Janice. Appreciate you, and you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. And out of Human Resources, Samantha Hendricks. Are you there, ma'am? I am, sir. Yes, sir, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Very good, very good. Well, it's so very good to see everyone. I know it's WebEx. Wish we could be in person. Uh, you know, I uh, we are still continuing to work in, with efforts on streamlining our HR processes and shortening our hiring process. Uh, We've made good progress on that uh, so far. We still have a lot more work to do. The team has been fantastic to work with. Um, I, um, uh, as you know, I have my report. I have submitted that. I'd be happy to answer any questions in relation to that or any other questions. Does anybody have any questions for Samantha? All right, it doesn't appear we have any questions. Samantha, good report, and you have a good evening. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks. 
All right, old business, there is none pending. New business? Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask to amend the agenda to add item, as item number nine, um, the resolution regarding the reappointment of Judge Luke Bartow. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? And um, I believe I've already told you, but I, I want to be a sponsor for this. I'd like to be a sponsor as well. Yes, I understand. But we can still be sponsors before that, regardless of whether there's a vote or not. So did you get all those? Go ahead and raise your hand if you want to be sponsors again. Okay, um, number one, under new business, uh, number one, uh, Councilman Sam, would you take that, please? Yes, this is a resolution confirming the reappointment of Fan Robinson as a commissioner of the Cherokee Nation Tax Commission. I put that in a form of a motion. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Number two, uh, Councilman Jordan, would you take that? Yes, this is a resolution confirming the reappointment of Edward H. Fight the third as a commissioner of the Cherokee Nation Environmental Protection Commission. And I put that in the form of a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, number three, Candessa, would you take that, please? Nation Foundation, putting that forward as a motion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, number four, uh, Councilman Kidwell, would you take that, please? This is a resolution confirming the reappointment of Sean Shepard as a board member of the Cherokee Nation Business LLC. I put that forward in the form of a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Can't speak. Yep. I'm sorry. You can't just call for a vote without transfer discussion. Is he even on? the uh, phone call list for his nomination. Okay, go ahead. What's your question? Is he here? Is he on? Yes, I'm here. Is he on? He's here, yes. Okay, perfect. Sean, how long have you been serving on with us as a board? Uh, it's been about six years. About six years. And how many candidates for office have you given to in those six years? I do not have that number exactly right now. Do you know how much money you've given to candidates in those six years? I do not know the exact amount, no, sir. Well, there's thousands and thousands of dollars that you've donated from your position of being at CMB board back to the contributions of political campaigns that run this business or run this tribe. And that's where it's hard for our people to have a free democracy whenever members of our tribal businesses are allowed to donate to campaigns of tribal officials. And for that, I'm going to have to vote no. And I appreciate you being on today to ask questions. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. Motion carries. On behalf of the sponsor. Pardon? On behalf of the sponsor on that. Okay. Did you get EO? Okay. Number five, uh, Councilman Callison, would you take that? A resolution. Nation business. I put this in the form of a motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any questions? Councilman Nofar? Yes, is Mr. Carter on? Mr. Carter, are you on? Well, such a high level nomination, I'm, I'm very disappointed in the fact that he wasn't on for calling in to ask for questions. So it'll be a no vote for me today. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. We have a. Motion in a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, number six, Sean, would you take that, please? Resolution supporting investment in Cherokee Nation Emergency Medical Services, funded under the Respond, Recover, and Rebuild Plan and other sources, providing an assessment of EMS services across the Cherokee Nation Reservation 
and supporting EMS services most in need, donating surplus EMS vehicles to Adair County. I'm really, really glad to put this in the form of a motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any uh, questions? Go ahead. Now, uh, Count Councilor Crittenden, there uh, have y'all, I guess, the uh, um, still um, Memorial Hospital that's there, right? Uh, is that where the EMS vehicles are going to go to? On that the one? Memorial Hospital? Yeah. No, it's Adair there? County Emergency Management. Okay, I'm just trying to. I know that the uh, mayor there. I just had seen where she had a report. Um, yeah, uh, they were a, getting some funding for a, some. It's a great, medicine. great thing for for Adair County. I know folks it's a great thing. A, there's just, a there's an ambulance service that's been there for a while. Had trouble with them. They're leaving town, and uh, we're in need of uh, somebody calling a calling uh, a absolutely. for an ambulance. And and we're in need. The still uh, old mayor. Uh, where, excuse me, Scott. Where our, excuse where me our, a second. I was asking for something. Our, uh, well, I'm just, I'm just letting you know. Seems like a lot of times, Adair County things, you like to stick your That's nose my, in there and try to, try to come up with, with something uh, that I was, well, just, you are welcome point, to. Point of but, order. But let's stay. Can, let's stay on topic. About this later. But I'm saying that's a great deal question. I was Adair trying County. to help out Adair yeah, County, which I see uh, where the mayor. That's where I'm at. Who has the floor? Councilman, the, the Councilman, floor there. Councilman, let's 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 okay, let's, let's, let's slow down. No, Sean, don't. I'm just asking. The mayor there had asked for federal assistance funding this past fall to help out Adair County with the MS vehicles. I was asking, is that going to be working with this? Is there some? Is there not an overlay there? I didn't know if you knew that. You're the counselor there. I'm being nice right, and being honored right, and respecting you. Right, Please respect right. me next time. I do. I do. All my family's from Adair County. I do, but it seemed like right. every time. Now, Not if, every time. If, if I've asked questions it, and you didn't know. All right, Speaker. Point of order. Right, speaker. Point of order. Yes. We're going to talk one at a time. Exactly. We're not. Well, you're interrupting, too. We're going to talk one at a time. And, guys, here's the deal. This is the, we're going to have a special council meeting about this later on tonight. So if you have your questions, it would probably be more pertinent to ask them then and not ask the council member, ask the people who have uh, brought this legislation forth. That's just a, a suggestion. I appreciate the suggestion. I was just simply asking because I wanted to know how, if both of those are going to work together. I, I hope that they do. I, I, I don't know where you think that I'm attacking well, I just think County. I think that we should well, probably just say that. I still have the floor too. Well, you can't just jerk it back well, from the me. Thing well, the thing is, right but speak. Councilman, you have interrupted him, and I'm just Jeez, trying to say. Jeez, God, just know how to handle the meetings properly. Whenever people are asking questions, quit demeaning them for asking questions. I'm just trying here to do my job. I asked a question about something that was going on in that county. I'm great for it. I'm glad that the, that we're going to do some vehicles there. They greatly need it. Councilman, I was asking about a previous thing that's there. Councilman, that's okay that I ask those things. Sure, but my point, but my point is this: you're asking Please. the wrong person, can, Councilman. I'm, I I'm just trying to make that's this where go. The, that's what. Listen, that is where wow. the. <sighs> program came from out of the city that they're going to work on a federal grant program. I want to know if that was something that worked together with. That's all. Jeez, I was just, I was just making a suggestion, to Councilman. About it. Jeez, we can move forward with it. That was uh, all I had a question with. Absolutely. That's out of line. Yeah, that's, that's just, just the way it is, I guess. Okay, so we had a resolution. Are we... Speaker Shamba? Yes, ma'am. Hi. If, if I may, just under Robert's Rules of Order, um, one counselor should not actually be asking questions directly of another counselor. I know we do it all the time because we're kind of informal with our Robert's Rules of Orders, but strictly speaking, all questions, even if they are to another counselor, should be asked to the chair. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the chair poses the question to the other counselor. And the reason for doing that is, a, you know, to avoid exactly what has just happened. And, uh, and to, you know, take personalities and so forth out of it so that counselors are never actually interacting directly with each other, but there's always somebody in the middle as a buffer. So I would just say that under Robert's Rules of Order, that's one option that we could begin to exercise. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate that. And I guess my point is that, you know, this this probably needs to go not to a counselor, but it needs to go to the actual author of this. That's where the questions need to go. 
All right, so we have a motion and a second. So have we voted on this yet? No. no. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, the motion carries. All right, number seven. Uh, Victoria, would you take that? Yes, it's an act amending Title 27 and hold on, of the Cherokee Nation Code. That's all I have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Put that form in a, in a motion. Second. Is it 27 or 29? 27 is first. Both. We're on number seven. There's two. Well, there's two. Seven's 27, and number eight is right. uh, 29. So, did you have that? So. Yeah, this is an act amending Title 27, and number 8 is amending 29. Okay, and some of them are. Okay, you might look on your book. Some of them are out of order, so this is the vote on um, Title 27. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? All right, number 8. Um, Victoria, would you take that? Yes, this is an act amending Title 29 of the Cherokee Nation Code. Moving forward as a motion. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, All opposed? I had a question. Yeah. I was going okay. to see if Chad Harsh was on there. I had a question with him about it. Since I don't believe he is. Chad, are you on? I, I am here. Oh, okay. okay. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, Chad, I know that um, we had... Uh, uh, started to update this to fall in compliance with what we're doing with everyone using their um, license or their tribal ID card as a hunting and fishing license. Um, there are current um, felons out there that aren't allowed to hunt or fish because they've been banned for life for whatever they did in their that, that allowed them to be a felon. How are we handling those if all they're going to have to do is whip out their ID with a li for a license? Well, I think an important distinction there is I'm not sure that um, that felons are somehow revoked of a hunting and fishing license. While it is true that a felon is un unable to carry a firearm in a lot of cases, they would be unable unable to hunt. So in that case, you know, if, if an individual has their hunt their uh, firearm right to carry a firearm license, license, it would apply within our jurisdiction just like it would anywhere else. But uh, this, this this idea that a felon is somehow unable to go fishing, I don't I don't know that that's an accurate statement. Well, maybe I, was, I wasn't trying to make it as a statement. I guess maybe I posed the question wrong. Instead of saying felons, um, you do have citizens out there that are unable to obtain a hunting and fishing license because of what they did. Um, they may have uh, illegally killed a deer outside of, uh, um, uh, of, of season, and then they get banned for life. They can't get a license again anymore. Are we now saying that since they were banned from life, if they're going to use their tribal ID card, that now they just get those rights back? I would say that individuals having hunting, a hunting license revoked is, is pretty uncommon. Um, and, and that would be something that would be, in, in, in these code changes, that, that's something that could be within the discretion of the court for an offender of uh, committing such a crime to, to have such a revocation as, as part of their judgment and sentence for criminal violations. Okay. But so right now what you're saying then, though, if I had, by the state licensing, uh, the, a law that, that bars me from getting a license because of what I've done, now I can go hunt and fish because I, I now have it. I can use my tribal ID. What I, would, I guess what I'm saying is under our code, if you have a tribal citizenship card, you are eligible to hunt and fish in accordance with our law. If there, is a, if there is some type of action that occurs by that individual where they have some type of limitation imposed on them by the district court, it would apply similarly in our, in our reservation as it would anywhere else. Okay. Well, I just, I think that might be something that we need to hurry up and take a look at because um, it definitely it's, appears to me that you can just get your tribal ID license and go hunt and fish even though you've been you know, banned from doing that, banned from getting a license to hunt and fish. We've now allowed those people who have um, abused the law and, and hunted and fished outside the regulations, done something illegal to where they shouldn't be allowed to have that, are now allowed to have that. So 
Um, it's just something that you, that we could take a look at, or maybe your office looks at writing up that we can pass to prevent that. So, but appreciate you an answering the question. Thank you, Speaker. Anybody else, Danny? Mr. Harsher, I, I noticed on, on the deal here you've got in the red. I guess that means it, that it's marked out. The use of glass, styrofoam, and plastic containers. Are we just con just condemn just putting it all into one big deal as trash? instead of uh, singling it out, or, or, or why was it this way? So I think you might be referring the, to the previous item, an act amending Title 27. Uh, that, that specific provision was sent across to, to uh, as part of our greater uh, update of our criminal code, uh, to, to uh, be able to enforce glass and styrofoam being used on the Illinois River. Uh, that, that is currently illegal, and it, wasn't, it, it was not an item that carried over in our previous code revisions. And based on conversations with GRDA, they. Um, the GRDA's enforcement folks, they ask that we um, make that, that, that repair. It is probably one of the most common citations issued on the Illinois River. So that is not part of the hunting and fishing code. That's pre previous, previous item number seven, and that's the basis for that request, that item. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, uh, we'll vote on Title 29. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? All right, motion carries. Any announcements? Oh, I'm sorry. Item nine. Um, Darrell, would you take that? <clears throat> this is a resolution confirming the reappointment of uh, Luke Bardo as district judge of the Cherokee Nation District Court, and I'll put that in form of a motion. All right, we have a question. Councilman No Fire? Hey, has Judge Barteau on? Yes. Hey, Judge Barteau, um, how long have you been uh, serving as a district court judge? Uh, coming up on five years. Coming up on five years. And in that time, has there been anything that's come up in your past or your history that we need to be made aware of? Being as a, a member of the bench. I mean, are, are you asking something specific? Anything, any kind of sort of arrests or anything to your ju to judgment of character of who you are? I, um, back in, I believe, 2018, I made a mistake. It was in uh, Cherokee, or I mean, Tulsa County. And um, I took the first uh, offer from the DA there that was offered me, and I turned myself into uh, the Supreme Court of Oklahoma at the time um, because they control my bar license and they reviewed it and said that um, everything was fine and that I would keep my license and move forward. Okay. Um, it's, not, it's not something I, I want to address on public record as to why and what happened. Judge, I really appreciate you as a, as a person uh, to coming forward and telling me those things. Uh, and, and I think that you're a, you're a great person, you're a great guy, you've done some great things while you've been on the bench. Um, you know, I think that uh, for me, it's just something that be more personal to take off record of further questions. For right now, I just, um, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna vote no right now for your appointment. I'd like to address that offline before I'd, I'd be able to give you my confirmation vote. Uh, moving forward, considering the matters of, of cases that you do handle, and it's important to have that. And of course, also could lay over into our our oath of office of of how we conduct ourselves and handle ourselves. But you're you're a, a, a good guy, great guy. Um, appreciate you coming back for renomination and, and answering those questions that I had. Appreciate it, Speaker. Councilman Deer. Hey, Judge, how are you? Um, Fine. Hey, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I'm actually pretty happy to be on sponsor on this because of the work you do. Um, as we know, we all make mistakes. Some are petty, some are big, but you know, your character has shown in the last two years since I've known you, working different situations, and I've called you, you've answered every time. You've called me back at the same day, not make me wait a day or two, but and I've also heard it from different constituents, the way you conduct yourself on the bench, and it's respectable. And being a Cherokee guy, I applaud that. So I say thank you. 
and I appreciate it. So that's all I got, Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Judge, I'd just like to also express my support to you. Uh, I, th I think you've done a great job on the bench. I've known many judges in my career, and, um, and watching you and the things that you're involved with and the, the things that you involve yourself with, uh, you go above and beyond uh, what a normal judge would do. So I just want to say thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, all in favor of reappointing Judge Barto? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, now we'll go to announcements. Are there any announcements? Okay, the only thing I'll have to say is um, I, I do think it's pertinent that when we do ask questions of each other or if we ask a person a particular question, we need to actually probably ask the author or whoever uh, authored that resolution that we have the question on and, instead of the councilman. I, I think it's just more apt to ask the uh, sponsor or the, or the author of that. So we're, we will do that in the future. Uh, I think Julia's right. Um, you know, we, we, we just don't need to be um, having those type of conversations because whether you realize it or not, I mean, when things get heated, you start interrupting each other, and that's the things just we shouldn't put ourselves in that position. So um, that is... Okay, that is all I have. Does anybody else have anything to say? All right, I need one. Uh, the next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, February 24th at 1 p.m. I need one more motion. All right, motion and a second. We're adjourned.